I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna read a testimony to you guys. You guys good with that? I love testimonies. Testimony means do it again. Amen. It means much more than that, but what God did one time, He'll do a lot of times, like forever. Are you ready? Okay. Oh, hey, Jesus loves you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So, Father, I just ask you to help, God. I need your help so bad. Every day, as years go on, it gets more and more and more and more intense. The awareness of needing his help and how good of a dad he is. He's so amazing. Father, we need to hear your heartbeat. We need to know what you think about us. We need to turn our affections off of the things of life and put our affections on you. Jesus, you, you say many good things about us, like only good things about us. You have more thoughts that outnumber the grains of sand in the whole world. Every thought's for our welfare. God, I believe that everybody in the body of Christ can get a hold of at least 10 of those thoughts, maybe 50 of those thoughts, possibly 100 maybe a thousand and if you had a thousand thoughts that God thought about you you wouldn't have time to think about what the world says you just you just wouldn't have time to watch CNN or none of that junk that needs the gospel we have the good news but people like to watch the bad news I just am done with that people say you can you know you gotta chew up the meat and spit out the bones I just refuse I, I don't eat things with bones I'm just meat eater it's a waste of time to have to go through and try to pick out meat when I can just I mean a bone's a bummer I just just give me filet period there's no bones around it in it anywhere it's just awesome yeah I just don't have time for it. I don't have time for TV. I don't have time. I don't have time for it. I just don't have it. The world's dying and I can't afford to be focused on things that God's not. God's focused on who He says we are. He's focused on the heart of man. I just believe that Jesus will fillet your heart tonight and leave you naked and not ashamed. Because Jesus is amazing because when you're naked before God, He can clothe you with Him. And when He clothes you with Him, you're just not ashamed. And I've spent, this is 13 years last year, it was 12, now it's 13. So I've spent 13 years, October will be 13 years, telling me that one day it's going to creep up. You just don't believe the gospel. You don't believe the blood of Jesus. We've taken the blood of Jesus and we've boiled it down to the blood of bulls and goats. And we've not considered the truth that's in the cross and we've devalued the very blood of God and to the Jew the blood of bulls and goats wasn't able to cleanse the conscience it left them condemned and to a large portion majority of the body of Christ they live with the consciousness of sin consciousness and haven't stepped into sun consciousness and I am so finished with any kind of excuses that take us out of, of, of sun consciousness because I don't have any time for it I'll set my mind on things above on the reality of what Jesus said on the finished work of the cross the reality of the finished work I won't ever move out of there people have told me you know let's move on to something else no we can't move on to something else until we get this we need to get this Hebrews 6 says that the repentance from dead works is the elementary principle of the gospel and it says we want to move on to greater things but like these things right here are attacking the body of Christ and they still live with an awareness of sin consciousness Jesus crushed sin in the flesh even it's so powerful it's so amazing but if we don't see it we won't be sun consciousness we won't be righteousness conscious we'll be sin conscious waiting for our breakthrough not realizing that 2,000 years ago Jesus broke through that heaven broke through he's already done everything for you that he's going to do as far as the finished work is but we have to stop going around the mountain around the wilderness and go straight into the promised land his name is Jesus he is the promised land Jesus is the promised land 
And we can't afford to dance around and go through the wilderness and say we're in a, a weary and dry land. Kick the dirt. Kick the ground. There are pools under there and they'll just spring forth. It's not a place of sadness. It's not a place of sorrow. It's a place of rejoicing. But we better live from the finish to the place of believing the simple gospel. The simple blood of Jesus. The simple he was crucified for my offenses. That's the one punch where he knocked the devil sideways. The devil thought that he won. He, Jesus allowed the devil to rip out his beard. Allowed the devil to, to whip him, to beat him, to, to stripe him beyond measure. Where he was marred beyond any man. He allowed him to do that. He allowed him. He laid his life down. No one took it from him. He did it all. He did it all. He allowed him to do it because he didn't understand that there was going to be a sucker punch of heaven to the devil where he would uppercut the devil because he was crucified for our offenses the devil thought he won but he lost big time see he didn't see the fact that when Jesus said unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies it can't reproduce the devil just it blindsided him he thought well that's stupid But Jesus said, unless a grain falls to the ground and dies, it doesn't reproduce. The problem is, is that when that wheat died, when that son of God died, he didn't stay dead. See, on that third day when Jesus rose, he changed eternity and he opened up the floodgates of heaven for every one of us to walk in the reality of what it means to be right with God. Every one of us. It is so powerful what Jesus has made available for us. And we're missing. Many of you have fallen short. Fear that you have fallen short and missed the reality of the rest of God. The rest. Be diligent to enter into His rest. A promise of rest for us still remains. Jesus says, come to me. All of you who are weary and burdened down by life, come to me and I will give you rest. And the body of Christ has enjoyed that rest that comes from the altar when we say yes to Jesus, but hasn't entered into a place of your soul being at peace with God. And the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus it's through the finished work there is no rest outside of the finished work because in your mind and in your heart it's to be continued and it's not continued it's finished Jesus whooped the devil with two sticks and a couple of nails and a mighty resurrection which was the uppercut crucified for our offenses and raised for our justification just as if I never missed it just as if I never ate the tree people persecute Christians that believe in the reality of right standing with God but it's the only thing that God wants you to see because Christianity is built out of that place and if we don't see why that veil was torn we will live on the wrong side of the cross for eternity and it's not okay well not for eternity till you die and you go and meet him you'll find out that you didn't believe the simple gospel and you'll make it in by the skin of your teeth and gosh you don't have skin on your teeth hopefully He really made it simple so that a child could get it, but we've complicated it because we need to figure it out. We don't don't need to figure it out. We just need to believe. We don't need to figure anything out. Stop being too smart for Jesus and just believe the simple gospel. Believe the simplicity of the gospel. It is not about you being technically brilliant, smarter than God, figuring it out and creating your own doctrine. It's not okay. It's just not okay. It's not okay. I just, all I know is my dad. I know that he's really good. I know that the blood of Jesus is enough. And if you need something else, it's a demonic strategy set up to get you bound. That will bind you in a place where you'll never get to the truth unless you believe that the blood was enough. You have to know that the blood is enough. You have to know that on that tree, he wiped out the transgressions against me. He wiped them out against you. He says, this is the covenant that I will make with them in that day. And we are in that day. Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. People have told me for years that I can't preach this. Well, you're wrong. It's getting more intense. And I'm seeing way more people get free. Way more people get free. So good. Jesus, you're so good. He's just so good. He's amazing. I think he wants us to dance around the walls of lies so that they crumble. 
I just really do. I just think it's, it's just such torment for people not to believe the simple truth. I'm not being mean. I just hate the devil. He's a liar. He is trying to blind the body of Christ from seeing what it means to be right with God. So that he can get her into performance to try to get right with God. And there is no performance to get you right with God. It's only the simple gospel. Jesus, I love you. I pledge my life to destroy this lie forever. As long as I breathe, I will destroy anything that interferes with right standing with God. I don't care what it is. I love Jesus. I'm going to go after this with everything I am. If you live sin consciousness, you'll wake up a sinner. If you live sun consciousness, you'll wake up a sun. If you go to bed a sinner, you'll wake up a sinner. But if you go to bed a sun, with the habitual nature to sin being crushed, the reality of what it means to have your conscience cleansed from all unrighteousness, which means the only thing that's left is right standing with God, you're no longer ashamed. I've lived for 13 years without guilt, shame, and condemnation. I don't live with an expectation of ever being fear because fear is only present when the love of God is not. Because the perfect love of God casts out all fear. There is no place to stay. There's no place for fear to land when I'm perfectly in love with my Father. There is no place. It's absolutely impossible. There is no place for worry to stand when I'm in trust of my Father. It has to do with finances, it has to do with your life, it has to do with praying for people, it has to do with you looking in the mirror and seeing what God sees, instead of seeing what God doesn't see and listening to what the devil says. Hey, my wife's watching. Everybody say, hi, Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Hi, Jackie. My kids are probably watching. Hi, kiddo. Yeah, I love my kids. I love my wife. <laughs> my little adopted son's probably watching. We adopted a little boy that was born addicted to heroin 14 months ago. Came out addicted. Came out, just came out addicted. <laughs> oh, with a mama that didn't understand who she was, and that's okay. And we got the chance of being legal guardians of that baby. And we went to rehab for three weeks. And I watched that rehab get shaken. I watched mamas and daddies that were condemned and beating themselves up because they're on methadone. And this is their second and third kid that's being born addicted. And nurses that are so upset because they should know better. It's, addiction isn't something where people know better. It's not something you just say, okay, I'm going to stop now. It's not. It's the devil. The devil is in charge of addiction and he needs crushed and cast out. The devil needs crushed. He needs crushed. Where's the Christian that would just fruit of righteousness is the works that Jesus did. The fruit of righteousness is the works that Jesus did because Jesus was right with God. How can we walk with more miracles? How can we walk with healing? How can we walk with the prophetic? How can we have more? Knowing that you're right with God. You can walk in gifting, but man, there's a place to step into to where, to where we walk like Jesus walked. To where he knew he was right with God. There was no condemnation. You couldn't condemn Jesus, man. And when you see that you're right with God, you can't be condemned. And this isn't just a fake smile on your face saying everything's okay. It is tears with weeping. And His goodness is so amazing that you're so overwhelmed because of what God has done. That every day you wake up and say, you are such an amazing father. I, I can't believe I get another day to manifest you and not me. This is awesome. Every day I wake up, God, you're so good. Another day. Oh my God, thank you. Four hours of sleep. Oh, Jesus, thank you. Another day. Oh my gosh. And I go and I hit my knees. And I, my kids were rubbing my knees the other day. We're watching TV. They go, Daddy, what is that? I said, it's Jesus, honey. They said, there's rough on your knees. I said, it's because your daddy needs to seek heaven with everything he is. Because I need to know my Father, and the best place to know Him is on your knees with weeping and just tears of joy. 
He loves us. We have to know Him. Can't afford to go through this life and be in this world and of it. Can't afford to incorporate Jesus into your life to have a better day. He's not here to give you a better day. He is here to possess you so that you can remind the devil every day that that one seed that died went in the ground. It ain't dead. It resurrected. The love of God and the goodness of God produces the fear of the Lord in you in such an intensity that you just can't even stand the thought of doing something outside of relationship. Even when a thought comes that's not Him, the Holy Spirit strikes that thing down. He convicts you of your right standing with God and it casts that lie out. It's just called relationship. It's called love. It's called the beauty of holiness. It's It only comes because He's good. It doesn't come because you fear and afraid of God that you're going to get caught. No, that's walking on eggshells. That's called the wicked flee when no one pursues them. Because you're doing twisted stuff and you know it's wrong. And you keep doing it and you keep separating yourself from the love of God. But when you see who you are, Proverbs 28, 1 comes and all of a sudden the wicked don't have to flee because you're not wicked anymore. You're born again and you're right with God. And the righteous are bold as a lion. You're bold as a lion. You're not walking on eggshells because there's no sin and secrets inside of you. There doesn't need to be closet Christianity. Jesus paid a price to crush all that thing and to cancel your lifetime subscription to issues. Why can't we just believe the simple gospel, man? The simple gospel. The simple love of God. I burn every day because He loves me. I burn now so people don't have to burn later. It's not about evangelists. It's about believers. It's about believers that are possessed with the right belief. You can be a believer that doesn't believe that you're right with God and live in condemnation and guilt. And you can incorporate the gifts into your life and move with some power, but you don't even like who you are, so you need another miracle to be performed so that you feel right with God. And that's demonic too. Jesus, help me. (laughs) I don't count it a small privilege to be able to speak to people. I don't care if I'm on a plane. It doesn't matter. It's important. It's powerful. It's, It's the reality of who God is and what He's come to do. He didn't come to just get us to play church. He came to make us the reality of the body of Christ, the fullness of Him that fills all in all. Jesus is the head and we stay hooked up to the head. And we learn and understand who God is. We don't just read a lot of books about God. We read the Word of God that trains our hearts, man. Instead of an instrument and a slave to sin in which you were, you become an instrument and a threshing tool to destroy hell because you're an instrument of righteousness. And then everywhere you go, you destroy the works of the enemy. And accusations come. You'd be surprised. I go and preach at places and these people are there with their bullhorns to like, to persecute me. I I guess I'm doing the right thing. Man, our war is not against people. Gosh, I'm overwhelmed. We need to see who we are. We, We can't afford to live twisted. We can't afford to live with secrets. We can't afford to not understand who we are. It's in the Word. It's it's in the truth of who God says you are. Hebrews 4.12 says that He separates our soul from our spirit. It's living and powerful. It's alive. It's not about you needing everybody to explain it to you. It's about the truth that's in God's Word. And it has its own ability to fulfill itself. But we want other people, we need teachers, and we need this. But the Bible is really clear that Jesus bridged the gap for you. He's actually a high priest that sits at the right hand of God. And when you pour out your heart and say, God, I don't understand the word, the high priest goes, Lord, he doesn't understand the word. Let's send some angels that hearken under the voice of you. Let's send some angels right now. Because they adhere to the word of God and they just perform it. 
Lord, I just, I just love this. Angels camp round about me. I haven't seen them, but they're all around me. It's amazing. I fear God. They live. They're around me all the time. I get this picture of them. So good. They are sent forth to help those that inherit that for salvation. They inherit salvation. It's Hebrews 1.14. It's so powerful. These angels are everywhere. It's amazing. I love it. They're there before you get there. They're there after you leave. They're there when you're there. They actually like drive the sword into people's heart and jam it up into their head. I love it. So that you don't have to spend so much time struggling trying to figure it out. People's hearts burn. Then Jesus just like, whoa, he fillets the heart. Puts the word in there. Boom. But it would be amazing if you'd open your own Bible and you'd get into your own secret place. I don't care what time of day it is. You could take a couple minutes a day. You could take a lot of minutes a day. Because once you start to see and taste and see that God is good, you won't want to taste the world anymore. Adultery won't even be a part of the church. Sexual immorality won't even be a part of the church. You won't need alcohol or drugs. You won't need money to satisfy something that money never could anyway. Jesus. Well, that's right. Amen. Oh. Oh, my. (laughs) How long will we love the simple ways? How long? Wisdom cries aloud in the street. Wisdom. The foundation of the world was built by wisdom. And God wants to give the church the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. We need to know the knowledge of Him. We need to be trained in it. And God has given us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Wisdom cries aloud in the streets. You know, in Corinthians, it says that Jesus has become for us the wisdom of God. Righteousness, sanctification, redemption. Jesus is the wisdom of God. But instead of seeking Jesus, we seek stuff. We want this to fix it. We want this video to fix it. We want this this book to fix it. We want this to fix it. And I understand we want to learn, we want to learn, we want to learn. But God has given us the word and the Holy Spirit has breathed every bit of it and the only way you'll get it is if you get on your knees and say God I don't get it and I want to please help me he'll speak to you oh open it up to where you get so excited to open the Bible every day you open it go, oh my gosh God what are you going to show me today this is amazing it won't be Russian roulette where do you want me to read it'll be oh my gosh You will see through the lens of right standing with God. And once you start to see through that lens, everything you open up in the Bible will speak to you about the same thing. The same thing. The blood of Jesus. The finished work of the cross. That God took you out of the old covenant. And through Jesus, He made a way, the way, to Yahweh. Where we can go right to Him. We can boldly approach the throne of grace. In time of need, we can boldly approach the throne of grace. We always need grace, so you can always stay in the throne room if you just know that it's available to you. The only way that you can boldly approach the throne is if there's no guilt, shame, and condemnation, because guilt, shame, and condemnation keep you from ever entering into the holy place. You have to understand this is so powerful. To the Jew, going into the holy of holies was so sacred and so scary. Like for thousands of years, they, there was no way for them to go in unless, unless everything was perfect and everything was done right. And only the high priest. Man, Aaron's two sons tried to go into the Holy of Holies and offer fire before the Lord. And they were killed by the fire of God. They were struck dead right there. And Aaron was silent because he knew that God was holy and he was to be treated as holy. David's man tried to steady the Ark of the Covenant Just steady it, and he died on the spot. It's crazy. You look at this, and so the Holy of Holies was such a scary place to enter into. And God tore the veil so it wouldn't be scary anymore. He wanted it to be simple, where we could just go simply to our Father. Jesus, we enter into the ve- through the veil, that's Jesus' flesh, into the presence of God. We get to enter in. And so when you go into your closet or where you go somewhere, you open your Bible and it's just you. 
God, I don't understand. You are right there in the presence of the Lord. Where you don't have to have somebody here to take you in there. Jesus paid the price and he's sitting at the right hand of God saying, won't you come? Won't you just come? Won't you come? Won't you come? I paid the price. Won't you come? Won't you just be with me? What are you doing? Oh my gosh. God, I need your help. I need your help to voice this in such a way that people will get it, God. I need your help, God, that people would just surrender. They stop playing church. Stop acting born again, but not living born again. They'd stop just saying, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, that's good. No, it's not good. I'm on the plane with the, the vice president of one of the biggest banks in America today, sitting beside him. And the airline attendants are coming up, and I'm, I'm talking to the one. She came up, and she goes, I watch all your videos. I just want to tell you how much I love you and appreciate you. I go, oh, well, thank you. And this guy's listening. He thinks I'm a rock star or something. <laughs> and I said, oh, I said, that's, that's nice. She goes, can you please pray for us, for my relationship with my boyfriend? He lives in Kenya, and I live here, and... I'm like, oh, yeah, sure, of course. So we pray, and it's awesome. And then I go up front, and the lady up front, I have a word of, about the lady up front, and she says, yes, it's actually, that's really true. I, and she's the happiest person on the outside. She puts on, like a lot of people do, they put on the mask of happiness and joy. But it's really not happiness and joy, because the only way that happiness and joy really happen is that when you see that you're right with God. It doesn't, happiness and joy, it's, it, we... Dude, people put on this face and act like it's okay, but they're condemned and guilty and ashamed and it's not okay because if you're a Christian, it's not part of your life. If you're a Christian and you're guilty, ashamed and condemned, you don't know Jesus. You do not know Jesus. Uh, you can say what you want, but the gospel is clear. You know the old covenant, but you don't know Jesus. Grace and truth came through Jesus. Grace empowers you to walk out what truth calls you to. You are to reign as a king in this life through the free gift of righteousness and the abundance of grace. You cannot reign as a king and royalty in righteousness the way that God wants you to. See, if you see that scripture and you think that it's just about dominion, you'll lord over people instead of having a servant heart for people. And it's not about reigning in righteousness, lording over people. It's about coming up underneath the people and celebrating people that don't deserve it. It's totally different. But grace reigns in this place through righteousness. And righteousness, we're supposed to reign as kings in this world. A royal priesthood, a holy generation set apart. It's so amazing. So this lady is really happy, but really sad. And she's really funny on the microphone and the way that she's describing stuff. And airline attendants, they're not so funny. They have to read that thing. And, but she's really making a great time of it. But you can tell that she's hurting. I can tell that she's hurting. So I went up and asked her, and she goes, I really need prayer. And I said, oh, I'd love to pray for you. She goes, pray that my past is gone. I said, are you a Christian? She goes, I've been a Christian for a, a lot of years. That breaks my heart. Why can't we just believe this? We've come up with remedies, remedies and band-aids and solutions that don't work. It's the blood of the blood of Jesus is the antidote. I promise you, there is nothing else. It's the blood of Jesus. Theories do not work. Saying that you're positionally right with God doesn't work if you don't know you're right with God. I'm positionally right with God. No, it's not just a position, it's a life. It's a life lived in the presence of God every day, all day long, to where there is no, there is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, who, who live according to the Spirit, because the Spirit, our Spirit and God's Spirit, they hook up like this. But God's Spirit and our Spirit had our day and have all the promises answered. No, God's Spirit and our Spirit hook up so that we can know what mind we're supposed to have. Because the Bible says that we have been given the mind of Christ. You don't have a right to think like a mere man anymore. We have been given the mind of Christ. You need to think with the mind that God's given you. People think it's blasphemy. That's because you don't read your Bible. 
It's in Corinthians 2. It says, who can know the deep things of God except the spirit that's from, uh, that's from God? And who knows the deep things of man except the spirit that's in a man? But the Holy Spirit, he reveals the deep things of God to our spirit, the, thing, the spirit that's in a man. And our spirit and the Holy Spirit hook up like this. He reveals those deep things to us. But when you're outside of relationship, see, there's a lot of confession and a lot of talk about identity and relationship through people that don't even have one. And it's not okay to talk about something that you're not in. Your identity is wrapped up in a constant communion with God. The love of the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and to the communion in the Holy Ghost. And that is where Christianity is supposed to stay. See, everybody wants the power of His resurrection, but not many people want the fellowship of His sufferings. The fellowship of Jesus' sufferings was that Jesus proclaimed to be the Son of God. He was the Son of Man, but he talked about his Father and him being one, being one. Jesus, at 30 years of age, would have inherited everything that his Father has. So him saying that he was with God was saying that he had equality with God. But Jesus considered himself of no reputation, even though he had equality with God. And so people can't get that, but Jesus carried the mind of God. And people say, well, that was Jesus. No, Jesus didn't do what he did as God. He did what he did as a man in perfect relationship with the Father through agency and communion with the Holy Spirit so that he could think with the mind of Christ. That's available for every believer, but we've been defeated because we've lived with a sin conscious mindset instead of a son conscious mindset. You can't afford to think sin consciousness when son consciousness has been established by Jesus. It says the blood of Jesus cleanses our conscience from dead works to serve God. You cannot serve God unless you think in son consciousness. We haven't allowed it to be finished, we've allowed it to be continued. And it's never finished because the devil always comes up with something new. You have to know that he's been defeated. Wow, I'm like burning, so I'm not sorry. <laughs> I, just want, I just want to see normal Christianity, that's all. I, why, why, why would people tell me that you can't live this way? They told me that in the beginning of my life. They tell me it still, you can't preach that. Well, you're, Jesus said that Noah was a man of righteousness. It says that him and eight other, eight people were saved and the whole earth was baptized, man. Baptized. Of filth, of trash. I'm looking at this and right standing with God, it's so amazing. It goes, Adam was blessed by God. Adam forfeited that. It was prophesied that Jesus was going to come. It's amazing. You know, you got Noah. Like, he's blessed by God. Be fruitful and multiply. Blessed him again. And then it goes on and Abraham was blessed. And I'm looking at this the whole way through and it's only because of righteousness. Abraham believed God. Man, he's a hundred years old. And God said, you're going to have a baby. How many of you at a hundred would say, all right. <laughs> How many of you whose wife was 90, 80, 90, 100 would say, yes. <laughs> but Abraham believed God. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. He believed God, and then it was accounted. And it says in Romans 4 that that's not just there for them, that's there for us. But we've not seen it like we need to see it. We've pursued a lot of things, but God says seek first. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and everything will be added to you. And I've talked about it earlier. I love what you said today, Jim. It was amazing. I'm like, oh my gosh, this guy's amazing. Every statement's coming. It's like, it's all scripture. All of it, the whole way through. I love it. Do you know the only way that you can cheerfully give is if you see that you're right with God? You can't give and, and not be right with God and be cheerful about it. Because you really don't trust God. 
Because if you trusted him, you believed that Jesus' blood was enough. Why do I feel like you guys are deer in the headlights? Don't look at me that way. It's the simple gospel truth. The word is alive. Our problem is that we haven't pursued God through his word. We've pursued God through all kinds of different things, but not through his truth. And we've allowed a lot of other things to be God. Man, I couldn't even read. I didn't know how to read my whole life. I'd never read a book. I couldn't. My, my brain was so fried because of drugs, because of all the junk, pornography from eight years old, hooked. <laughs> Jesus. He comes and he's like, <laughs> He takes the mind. He took my mind and he took it away and he put his in there. But that's not just for me, that's for every Christian. We just don't believe. I told a lot of Christians, they think that's blasphemy to even say that. The only reason is because you don't see it in your Bible. God says, don't you be conformed to this world. But how many people stress and freak out when they read what's going on in the world? And we said, well, you know, it's, it helps. It's, it's wisdom, brother, to find out what's going on. Why would you need worldly wisdom to find out what's going on? Why wouldn't you seek the Word of God, the truth of what God says, so that you can impact what's going on with what He did in you? Why would I allow that stuff? Why do I allow CNN and the bad news to trump the good news? Why would I allow any of that stuff to have any effect on me? People ask me all the time, well, you just don't know what's going on in the world. Oh, I do. I do. I'm in the world, but not of it. No, you're just in fantasy land. Maybe, maybe my mind is set on things above. Maybe I'm not out of my mind. Maybe I'm out of yours, but I'm not. I'm just possessed by the truth. I believe my father. I don't care what he says. I believe it. If I read it in there, it's done. It's over. It's finished. Like I, I've settled it in my heart that God's word, he magnified it above his own name in Psalms 138 verse 2. He magnified his word above his name. God thinks more highly of his word than you think he does. God and his word are one. I just, I love it. Oh, I'm going to preach it. Every day of my life, I'm going to preach it. All day long, not just to you, to everyone that I meet. It doesn't matter. I am a seed sowing machine. I walk around with a machine gun full of seed. I don't play. I don't play. I don't. When I'm on a plane and I talk to somebody, they say, How you doing? I'm not kidding. I'm so serious. I'm talking to this amazing vice president of one of the largest banks in America today. And he goes, and I get done talking to the ladies and stuff, and, and they're like, come here. So I go up front, and they're like taking pictures, and, and that's cool. I don't mind doing that stuff. Don't you come up here with your camera. <laughs> I don't mind doing that. I just, I need them to know the gospel. I need them to know the truth. I need them to know, I need to know that they're born again and that they know who God is. My first priority is that you must be saved. You must be. You must be. I can't afford to sit next to you or be around you and have you not get saved. You are not an inconvenience to me when I am rushing through an airport. Someone stops me. You're not an inconvenience to me. I'm in traffic. People aren't an inconvenience to me. When somebody, they're not an inconvenience, they're an opportunity. But we miss opportunities. Telemarketers shouldn't be an inconvenience to you. You should want to share the gospel instead of hang up on people that are rejected all day long. Someone calls your house, you see it's a telemarketer. People don't even do it. Mormons come to the house and they come to the door. People don't even answer it. I love that stuff. Come on in. What are you going to do? You're not going to take this away from me. Oh no, one of us is going down, bro. I'm not kidding. When I'm in an elevator, it's on. Why? Because they're an opportunity. I talk about Jesus as soon as that door shuts. Boom. Hey, Jesus loves you guys so much. Did you know? Well, I don't believe in any of that. Wow, well your right shoulder is killing you right now. So why don't we pray for that real quick. And then once he heals you, you'll know. 
And they say, well, how do you know about that? Well, go, well, you know, maybe God's speaking to me. Well, I don't believe that. Well, let me pray and let's find out. I'm not playing with this, man. It's real. To me, it's like Mount Carmel. Everybody. God will send fire. I'm not afraid. I'm never going to die. I'm just going to go be with Jesus. I believe the gospel. I believe it. See, some of you think I'm crazy. See, I live with me. I'm not sharing something that I don't live. I live it every day. So this vice president and I are talking, and I'm sharing with him, and he goes, well, you know, I, I just, I said, you're a Christian? And he said, yes. I said, that's awesome, man. I started sharing my heart and shared my testimony with him. He's like, oh my gosh, that's crazy. I said, yeah, it's so crazy. It gets worse, and I kept going. I shared about me wanting to kill my girlfriend if she left me. I was so jealous and so full of rage because she became my Jesus. And that's what happens in relationships where you don't know God. I went into a store this morning and there's a girl in there that I see. And I walked in and I knew that something was wrong. And I said, honey, are you okay? She goes, well. I said, no. I said, your heart's broken right now. It has to do with the boyfriend. She goes, yeah. I said, you know what? I said, it's only because he's moved into the place where Jesus is supposed to be, honey. She said, oh, there's a lady coming in the store. She's crying. It was really awesome. And I went in the back and prayed for her, laid hands on her, prayed for the shalom of God so that God could take first place. You know, Abraham was told by God that you're going to have a son. And it was this seed coming through that all, all the nations were going to be blessed through this one. You know, we, we say that when Abraham went up on that mountain and God said to sacrifice Isaac, we think that Abraham was sad. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say that he was sad. Now imagine that. Not being sad because God told you to go, like, stab your kid. We said, well, why would God do that? Because God needed Abraham to move Isaac out of first place so that God could know that he was in first place. But Abraham believed God so much that, look, I killed this boy, he's going to raise. That's what the Bible says. Why? He trusted God that if he plunged that knife into Isaac's chest, Isaac was going to die no matter what because Abraham wasn't aiming for his thigh. Abraham was going for his heart. See, we don't think that way. We think because we see all these movies where Abraham was crying and, oh my gosh. That's not the Bible. It doesn't say that. It says Abraham believed God that even if that he will be raised from the dead. Imagine that. Having such faith in God that if God said sacrifice your kid, I'm killing my kid. God's going to raise him up. It's over. Don't do it, Abraham. It's really awesome. But it's faith like God wants us to have. Not that you can kill your kid, but that you can kill every idol that stands before God. Every idol that stands before you having relationship with the King of Glory. It's not really that tough. Submit to God. It's the one step program. Submit to God. And when you do, the devil's resisted. The problem is, is that when we say submit, we give him this much. Well, I'll give you a little bit more. I don't know. It feels okay, but I don't know. It's a little shaky here. I'll give you this much. That's not submit to God. That's incorporate Jesus. You will be destroyed because you have lots of idols that need to be crushed in your life. Come on, man. If the shoe fits, kick it off. You know, God's given me grace to go and speak at all these different places. And I am so thankful, but I don't take it lightly. Every time I'm in front of people, I'm accountable for every one of your hearing. Every one of you. I'm responsible for how you hear. Let me compromise this word to build a big, a big crowd once. And I'll answer before God, you will be judged for your life. People say, no, I passed judgment. Oh, you did. You passed the white throne judgment. You didn't pass the judgment seat of Christ. <laughs> we don't even like to talk about that one. Oh, I promise you, I'll stand before that judgment seat. I'm going to answer for every idle word. By your words, you will be justified, or by your words, you will be condemned. Take it up with Jesus. God thinks really highly of the way that you speak, because out of your heart, your mouth speaks. Come on, we're, we're really quick to just... We say, we, we claim James 3 and say, well, no one can tame the tongue. Hey, you know, praise God, curse you. That's not good. 
That's what we say. We say that. We use that scripture as a scapegoat to never let our mouth be clean. We don't realize that the words that we speak are life and death. I should read the curse so that you guys can see what you're free from. It's, it's amazing. You read the curse. Not many people like to read it. They're like, oh my gosh, that's bad. No, you need to know it because this is everything you're not. Jesus became the curse. People say, well, there's still curses. No, no, no. Mm -mm. Not when I've been born again. The bloodline crushes everything. Unless you don't realize the bloodline that you're in. Unless you think your family still has anything to do with you or you with them. When it comes to bloodline and generational curses that consider up, can continue to a third and fourth generation. People don't even like to talk about this. Well, I'm going to talk about it. Because if Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin so that I might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. What if I don't see what I've become? What if I don't see the cross of the reality of the redemptive work that Jesus did? He didn't just redeem me and purchase me and ransom me. He brought me back to the original place that I was in the garden as if I'd never ate the tree. But if I don't see that, I'll be condemned and guilty and ashamed. We're just getting started. I don't know how much I have, but I, time I have, but I, I love him. I, I, you know what I would love to see? I'd love to see you wake up in the morning and go, oh my God. It's a whole new world every day of your life. Get up. What if you looked in the mirror and you saw what God saw? You wouldn't see your faults, your failures, your shortcomings. You'd see a spotless, blameless bride that is free from all guilt, all shame, all condemnation, all that twistedness. You'd see one that is free from the trembling heart. You'd see one that is free from the guilty conscience. You'd see one that is free from all shame. You'd remind the devil and make him full of shame. See, he wants you to think like him. He is full of shame, full of guilt, full of condemnation, full of depression, full of anxiety. There's no chance for him. Today might be the time when the trumpet blows. And he's trying to possess as many people can with the thoughts of him. So that we can never see and understand the mind of Christ. Do you know he said to become like a little kid? A little kid just says, Dad, I believe you. That's it. Dad, you said it, I'm in. Oh, I wanted to read that testimony. I can't yet. We will. My gosh, what if everything I'm sharing is true? What if I didn't, what if I didn't just come up with it before service today? What if I weren't, wasn't just studying my Bible? Okay, God, what do you want me to say next? What if this is just what God has done in my heart over 13 years, and it's just all coming out like a fire hydrant? Why? Because the more truth that comes out, the more lies have to go. Because what happens is a stronger one comes in and strips the strong man of his armor. The Word of God is like that. He, we say that's just for deliverance. It is, but you need to be delivered of every lie that is against the reality of being right with God. Now, I was in Brazil the other day, and I walked into the restaurant, and I'm in there. We're in a chahascaria, which is like... So amazing, so much meat. How many of you know what picanha is? It's from the Lord. I mean, the Lord created every animal, so it is from the Lord. He created vegetables too. I love them too, right beside my picanha. So I went there with some with some people. I was down in uh, Brazil. I was doing a meeting with um, Heidi Baker. I was down there. Daniel Kalenda, Eric Gilmore, just Scott Lee. We were having an amazing time doing a fire conference in Brazil, in Curitiba. It was like, I don't even know. It was ridiculous. Amazing. Beautiful. Yay. I watched people just get, uh, 
so good. Anyway, we went out to a restaurant after the conference was over, or, and I'm like, yeah, let's go. And, and we went, and I'm talking to the manager and some other employees. I said, hey, I said, you know, Jesus loves you so much. Well, oh, thanks, man, okay. They kind of like, just relax. They're bringing around the things, kind of, Jesus loves you, and they can't really speak, so I have an interpreter, help, help. So he's interpreting for me. And uh, I'm, I don't know how to speak. The only thing in Brazilian I know how to speak is my fogo, which means more fire. <laughs> which has really worked well. It was amazing. Oh, and Carlos Anacondia was there too. I said to Carlos, I said, I need you to lay hands on me. This is before we went to the restaurant. I said, pray for me that every devil in the room gets manifesting when I come in. I want every de- I don't care where I'm at. I want every devil to manifest Whenever I walk in the room in a plane, I don't care where I am, I want devils to go manifest themselves and go crazy when I come in the room. Pray for me. Lay hands on me. And I said, pray for me. So he lays hands on me. And I don't understand what he's saying because it's Argentinian. But it was beautiful. And amazing. What a legend in Argentina, buddy. A legend in the faith. A hero of the faith. Like he has this crazy just deliverance he comes on the platform devils just start crawling around crazy stuff I'm like I want that Ah, and they have nowhere to go nowhere to go why would I be afraid why would I fear a devil why would I fear a demon the only way I fear a demon is if I don't know who I am the only way I might fear a demon is if I need a book on how to deliver 700 different ways to deliver a demon that Jesus said get out I need to have and I'm not making fun of deliverance stuff I'm not because it's a real thing it's real but I believe there's a simpler way and I need that I I don't want I'm a little kid I don't need I can't have 700 ways it's too complicated for me I don't want 700 different ways I just want to know the name of Jesus and the power and dominion that is in the name of Jesus. I, I don't want to know all those different things. I don't, I don't care to know. People send me stuff. They're like, all these different... I don't want it. I don't want it. Keep it. I love you, but I don't want it. I got the Bible. Just let me have the Bible. Let me go. Let me, let me believe the truth about God's Word. Just let me go. <laughs> you have no idea. We get all kinds of stuff. Well, you don't understand. You, you need this too. I mean, you have to use wisdom. No, no, no. Anything that you say you've got to use wisdom outside of the Word of God is the devil. <laughs> it is. Take it up with Jesus. He thinks His Word is really important. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So anytime I look in the Word, I'm looking into God. I, I, I'm looking into God. It was hidden... And then God opened it up. Boop! It was hidden in days past. It was hidden. It was like a secret. It was a secret. It was hidden. The prophets prophesied about a day that was going to come when it was going to be opened. And now we have it and it's open and we don't really realize what we have or we'd be way more joyful about what we have. It's only like, I only got like 35 people clapping, dude. So I'm totally... Totally offended a lot of people. <laughs> so we're in the restaurant and I said to the manager, I said, I need you to help me. I, I, need, you, I need you to ask all the employees I want to pray for. Because a couple people got healed and I was praying for a table of people and Jesus was touching people and it was awesome. And then she was like, whatever. And I'm like, okay, well, let me pray for you. Well, I don't believe in that. That's okay. It doesn't matter. Don't. Stand there and don't believe. Let me pray for you. I don't need you to agree with me. I really don't. I don't think Jesus did. Jesus didn't say, are you guys in agreement? I mean, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Are you guys good? Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can't be my disciple. You can't have any part of me. Are you guys okay with that? Let me, let me back it off a little. No, he didn't say that. He didn't. And Jesus wasn't talking about communion. He was talking about your very sustenance needs to be Him in everything you do and say, or you cannot be a disciple.
I'm the bread that came down from heaven. Okay? Yeah, uh, my flesh is the real bread and my blood is the real drink. All right. No, no, no. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. And we say that Jesus was just talking about communion. He wasn't. Communion is amazing, but when you do it, it's not just about the act of communion. It's about the remembrance of what Jesus did for you. And if you don't live with the remembrance of what Jesus did for you, watch this. If you don't live with the remembrance of what Jesus did for you every day, you will live with the memory of what you wish you never did every day. I promise you. It would be good for you to feed on Him. It would be good for you to eat the Word. Take some time away from real food and get in the Word and say, God, I, I'm just, I'm hungry. And, and hunger and thirst for reality of who God's created you to be. Hunger and thirst for righteousness because He promises you'll be filled. All you have to do is set your focus on the right thing, which is righteousness, which is the only thing, actually. There is no other thing. Mm. So the manager, I'm praying for a table, and he's just kind of standing there looking at me. And I'm praying for a table, and I get done. He goes, all the, all the waiters left. I go, oh, okay. I said, wow, well, let me pray for you. He's like, okay. So he comes over, start praying for him, put my hand on his belly and his back. All of a sudden, like, he knee drops on my toe. No, no, no. I mean, like, like bam, lands on my toe. Like, and I felt my toe go in the restaurant. And the man is on me, and I'm holding him in the restaurant. And all the other kitchen staff and everybody's there, and people are there. He looks at me, and he looks up at me, and he goes, and his tongue comes out as far as I've ever seen a tongue go out. And it starts doing this, and he starts foaming everywhere at the mouth. Now, what do you do? You're not going to break out your iPhone and try to, like, figure out, like... Is this from his uncle? Which one is this? It's too late. It's too late to try to figure out which one this is. How about stop wondering which one and just know it's a devil and it doesn't belong? I'm not kidding. We've complicated this. Jesus said these signs will follow them that believe. The first sign of a believer is they cast out devils. It doesn't say these signs will follow them that believe. One day they'll come to heaven. It doesn't say that. We have a job to do. And it's out of our right standing with God. But there's no condemnation, no guilt and shame. Because when this is happening, I can't afford to think guilt, shame, condemnation, or dominion. And I have authority over this thing and I need to get tough. It's not about your tough. You will be plummeted in that place. The seven sons of Sceba tried to do that same thing. I cast you out in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches. Bam, bam, bam. And they are done. They left naked and ashamed. It's about the love of God that He has for you. The reality of the finished work that He did for you. That you can't add to it. And He wiped out the transgressions that were against you. And you need to know that you're right with God. And you do not have to perform to try to look cool. Because you won't look good. Because this devil that was in this man was really mad. But you know what he couldn't do? Anything but this. And his little tongue was flying around. I said, you're not staying in here. I didn't have to speak Portuguese. I just had to say the name of Jesus. I'm not, I'm not boasting in my ability to cast out devils. I am boasting in the blood of Jesus, the truth of the simplicity of the gospel, the reality of what he paid a price for us to live in. You do not have to try to perform You need to submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee. It's just surrender. Stop playing games with the gospel and believe the truth. Let God have you.
Stop resisting him. Stop trying to figure it out. Stop trying to fix your 34 years of trash and believe that Jesus did it all. So I prayed for him and he got louder. And he's spitting everywhere. See, it's funny now, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't be laughing. I'm not kidding. Because I'm holding this man and his arms are straight out and his feet are straight out and all the employees are standing around. And he is shaking. And his eyes, I can't get his eyes open. And I said, I don't think so. No, you're going to look at me right now. And I peeled his eyes open. So he could look at me. And I said, you're letting go. It's the blood of Jesus. Every knee will bow because of the blood of Jesus. Every knee will bow. One day you're going to bow, you're going to be made to bow, or you can bow willingly now. You know, I, I, that's what I tell people. People get mad at me. It's like, well, I don't believe in your gospel. Well, you can willingly bow now or be made to bow later. You, you really don't have a choice. You can think that you do. The Holy Spirit is bigger than what you think. And I believe that He's going to pounce on you. And tomorrow morning when you wake up, He's going to be on you. And you won't be able to get out of bed until you hit your knees and bow to Jesus. I just believe it with all my heart. So once I peeled His eyes open, this thing left. He went limp. He sweat, slobber everywhere. He looks at me and He goes... I'm sorry. I said, I, 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 don't move. Right now you need Jesus, bro. You're not getting up until Jesus fills you. He looks at me and he goes, what? I said, and I shared the gospel with him. He goes, oh, yes, I, I want Jesus. I said, okay, now it's time. So the Holy Spirit just baptized him beautifully right there because this thing needs filled. This void that should have been Jesus. And you know what he told me? He said, I, I cheated on my wife a while back and when I did, I something happened adultery brought a devil in see what you don't know is that sexual immorality and all that stuff brings the demonic active in your life you think that it doesn't but I promise you I promise you I've watched many people be delivered that have stepped into a place they shouldn't be boyfriends sleeping with girlfriends because they think it's okay and no one sees God sees everything and the devil loves it the devil's like, yeah, all right, one more time. Does it feel good? You know it feels good. Do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again. And we think it's okay. Oh, I promise it's not okay. I promise it's not okay. See, you're looking for love in the wrong places. Men of God, if you're really a man of God, then don't try to get a woman to compromise. But don't, don't even. You can think what you want, but I, I ask God. That if you're in that place and that's in your life, I ask God to shake you in such a place that you can't live with yourself anymore. I promise you, especially if you're, if you're not a Christian, hey, I, I'm not speaking to you. But if you're a Christian, I'm speaking to you. Because you'll be judged for your life and you will answer for your life. And we're like, well, I don't think so. I mean, I'm still praying for the sick and the sick are still getting healed. If you think that's a validation of whether you're right with God, you are greatly deceived because the disciples prayed for the sick and weren't even born again <laughs> I promise you I love you but sexual immorality shouldn't even be in the church man it says there's sin outside the body then there's sin done inside the body it's not okay with God I promise you I'm not preaching legalism I love Jesus with all my heart but how can you expect to walk in the dominion that comes from right staying with God if you're still dabbling in trash it's because you haven't tasted and seen that God is good because if you taste and see that he is good it's amazing you won't want to taste the other thing you won't want to have your cake and eat it too because God is so good that cake isn't good it's not sugar's from the devil anyway don't eat cake it is look it up look up refined sugar and you'll see the devil right behind you So this man gets born again. He gets filled with the Spirit of God. He gets up on the floor. Oh, I'm so sorry. And he hugs me. I said, man, it's not sorry. You don't have to be sorry to me. You already repented in your heart. 
for what you did with your, to your wife. And he, he had told her about it, and they stayed together, and it was, but it was really, really bad. And I said, man, you're free. <laughs> Don't look. This one waiter comes up to me, and he goes, I, I want you to pray for me. I go, oh, man, that's awesome. He goes, I love God. Pray for me. It was almost like he was saying, read me and see that I'm pure. That was so amazing. What if you knew that you were pure? What if you knew? What if you knew and didn't have anything that convicts you? See, if you're convicted of righteousness, you won't live in a place like if something's wrong and you step in it, God will convict you. But if you repent, it never gets to condemnation. This is the this is the simple gospel. You keep your conscience clean. If something violates it, you repent. And all of a sudden, God just keeps cleaning, keeps cleaning, keeps pruning, keeps clipping, keeps clipping. And you're bearing so much fruit. And if something's not bearing fruit that God wants, He clips the whole thing. And then, and then two, twice as much grow out. It's awesome. You can't afford to live that way when Jesus paid a price for you to know who God is. He loves you. Like he loves you, he loves you profusely, like so intensely. Like you wake up in the morning and you wake up with this love. Like how great is this love? Repent. It's just good. God is good. God is good. He wants to, he wants to heal you. He wants to make you whole the whole way through. Like all that stuff. Like he wants to heal you of all that stuff, man. Sexual immorality, all that junk. It's what's being healed right now. It's over. Over. You will never be the same. I'm not kidding. All that stuff that we've invited in. All that junk that you've invited in. Right now, God's just going to set you free right now. I'm really not kidding. I'm really not kidding. More, Lord. Be free. God, I ask you to wash people right now. Esau sold his birthright for a moment in the flesh. And that word moment in the flesh... Because that, that bowl of porridge was a moment in the flesh. He sold his birthright. Says it in Hebrews. And it says that when he did that, he forfeited his identity. He sold his birthright for a moment of feeling good. God, I ask you to bring great conviction right now. Holy Spirit, I ask you to shake Holy Spirit, we invite you right now. God, I love you. I ask you to do it all over the room right now, God. That you would deliver people of this bondage in the name of Jesus. I command these things to leave. In Jesus' name, now. Now. More Holy Spirit, come right now in the name of Jesus I command it right now every bit of sexual immorality I command it every bit of bondage that's been brought in through that thing right now that pornography thing in the name of Jesus I command it to be shaken now more Lord I ask you to do it right now in the name of Jesus do it God more come Holy Spirit Touch your people right now. Cleanse in Jesus' name right now. Ladies, you are not that type of girl. More. More, Lord. If you're in that place and that's you, I need you to stand to your feet right now. If that's you, I need you to stand up right now. Jesus, I thank you. 
Don't be ashamed. Don't let guilt hold you in that seat. Don't you just want to be free? Holy Spirit, I just welcome you. I welcome you to do what you do right now, God. Do what you do. Cleanse people. Cleanse them, God. Cleanse them, God. Cleanse them, God. Cleanse them, Jesus. Do it, God. Do it. Right now. I ask you for more right now. Do it, Holy Spirit. Do it. Do it, God. Do it. In the name of Jesus. Don't be ashamed. If this is you and you want to be free, I challenge you. Stand up. Let's get free. Let's stop. Let's get free right now. The anointing will break the yoke right now. It's not about you being worthless. It's about you being worth the blood of Jesus. If this is you and this is part of you, God wants to set you free right now. Right now. Put your hands on your head right now. Father, I thank you for the blood of Jesus right now. The blood of Jesus right now. That that pornographic devil, that that sexually immoral devil would be gone. It's not okay. It's not okay to have that in your life. It's not okay. You were not created to outside of wedlock. You were not created to sleep with people or even have that thing rule your life. It is demonic. It is set up to destroy you and set up to pervert covenant. There are boyfriends and girlfriends that are in this room that are together, that are in the act, that are not standing up. I pray that the Holy Spirit shakes you and trembles your heart and brings you to a place of repentance because He loves you and He wants you to be free. People around, people that are standing, I want you to get up and I want you to pray and I want you to lay hands on them right now. We're going to pray.
Father, I thank you. I want you to lay hands on everybody that asked for prayer right now. In the name of Jesus. Right now. I want you to just declare this one thing. Freedom. Right now. Freedom. Be free. Jesus. Be free. Let go. Let her go. Jesus' name. Be free. right now you will see change from this thing that we prayed for right now you will see change I'm gonna read a testimony for you and then I'm gonna ask you what God's speaking to you about hunger and I want you to listen yay freedom three months ago my father was diagnosed with a brain disease that's incurable called PSP There are only 12 cases in the world with people that have had this disease and all have ended in a quick death within five to six years. My father was 18 months into this debilitating disease. Most people end up choking to death, which is the final stage of this disease. You can't swallow. Symptoms my father has has, were memory loss and he started falling around. His brain would tell him to move, but his body wouldn't respond. He suffered many concussions, scrapes, 
bruises, bruised bones, all kinds of bad stuff. It had gotten so bad that doctors prescribed for him a cane that shortly came after and he needed a walker if he was going to walk because he, he couldn't walk anymore. They sent him to a therapist to teach him how to properly use this walker. They sent him to a speech therapist, told him that his speech would be so slurred that he wouldn't be able to be understood. Doctors at the Cleveland Clinic and University Hospitals recommended that my father stop working immediately, file for Social Security. With a couple of weeks, in, within a couple of weeks, they were going to recommend that he stop driving because they were afraid he was going to hurt somebody or kill them when he was behind the wheel. This was a real diagnosis that was very grim. There's no cure for this brain disease. On top of this, my father was born with an ankle and hand disorder called CMT. The muscles in his feet, ankles, and hand deteriorated throughout his life. And he's been wearing leg braces for 10 years. So a fall every now and then, because of this, wasn't uncommon. So now this was worse, that everything else was coming. On the week of July 4th, our family got together to enjoy festivities, to spend some time with Dad in Germantown, Ohio. At this point, he looked out, he was only 63. He has to be helped up and down the stairs every time. During these four days, he started losing feeling in his left leg and started sw it started swelling. He went to the Cleveland Clinic and they told him that he had blood clots in his leg now that started to bruise with dark veins started to show up and it was extremely painful. My older sister, Cece, had been helping him with office work and driving him to work appointments and doctor visits. Her ex-husband felt compassion and led to bless the fa my father and decided to take him and my sister and their three kids to the Holy Land, to Israel. It was my father's dream to go to Israel with his grandchildren, it was one of those things that was on his bucket list before he died if he only had a few years to live. Upon returning from Israel, they went through the D.C. airport. Now what I'm going to share with you is a testimony that happened because I was walking through the D.C. airport and I was late for my plane. I was headed to the call in Cleveland to be with Lou Angle at the call there. And I was in the airport at the same very time. But we're going to pray after I read this testimony because I believe that God wants to answer the cry of the hungry and he wants he wants people to be baptized into him so that they can actually be a conduit for Jesus to flow through I'm telling you this isn't a testimony of what Todd can do this is a testimony of what somebody that's submitted to God through righteousness can live it's not about me it's about Jesus but it's about being willing to stop for the one it's about the one everywhere we go. It's not about the millions, it's about the one because every one is in that millions. They went through the DC airport, which was not supposed to happen. Her name was Alana. She decided that she wanted to go to Starbucks coffee before she boarded the plane. She had no phone on her and they were, we were running extremely man by the, by the train with dreadlocks and funny looking shoes. Now watch, now listen. If you don't understand who you are, this will hurt your feelings. She started making fun of me because, making fun of this man because of his shoes and made a, spark, a smart comment to him. She then started to walk away and this man said, you need to come back. Now this isn't about a person, this is about a conduit for Jesus. This is about a conduit that knows they're right with God, that can hear the voice of God for people. In the midst of busyness, of clamor, of being late, and all, I was flying across the country to get to a flight, and I'd already flown to the United States, now I'm flying across the country. I have one shot to make it, and I'm supposed to be there. I'm landing, at, I'm supposed to be landing at like 11.30, and I speak at 2, and it's like really short shot of making it. Started to walk away, and he said, come back. The Lord gave this man insight what was going on to my family. And he told her that there was a person in the airport, a part of her family with a disease that Jesus wanted to heal today. At that moment, she knew this was something very big and decided to bring this guy all the way to the other. And now I'm late for my plane. But she is not an inconvenience. But if you're in a hurry to get nowhere, you'll miss everybody in between. This is about being submitted and surrendered to the call of God on your life. It's not about... It's about being right with God. Everything I preach tonight, it's about being right with God, not having junk, that whole thing in your life, but being pure in your heart. Because the pure in heart shall see God. At that moment, she knew this was something very big and brought this guy in the direction of his flight. And he, and he obviously was going to miss his flight at this point. But he did not care and he felt he needed to go with her. Of course, I felt like I needed to go with her. She has somebody that's dying in the airport. 
And my flight is not more important than a person's life. Because what if that person doesn't know Jesus? They need to know Jesus because what if they die and they don't know Him? They eternally separate from Him and I'm convicted of my right standing and I need every Christian to know their right standing. He was on his way to a place called Cleveland to attend an event called The Call. Once they found our group, this gentleman introduced himself as Todd White and gave a testimony of what Jesus did in his own life. He told my father that there's no disease in heaven and he wanted to lay hands on him because it's supposed to be on earth as it is in heaven. And pray for him. He told him that the Lord was going to heal him. That's a big statement to make to somebody. And sometimes we think that we're building false hope. But what if you have faith? Faith isn't false hope. Faith speaks to the mountain and mountain moves. I'm not saying that I've seen every mountain move. But I am. But I'm growing in a place where I'm seeing more mountains move than ever before. They found our group. Oh, okay. My sister and this man laid hands on my father. And my sister felt something shoot back through his brain all the way to her feet. And at that moment, my sister started speaking in tongues. So the sister, while we're praying for the father, gets baptized in the Holy Ghost. In the airport. People say, well, how can that happen? It's collateral blessing. There were no physical signs of healing at that point. They boarded their plane, and this man went to, to board his plane. The next morning, my father got up out of bed without any assistance and walked outside down a steep driveway. Listen to this. Walked down a steep driveway to grab a trash can, and he brought it up. When my mother saw this, she was yelling at him and asking him if he was crazy. My father walked in the house and said, something has happened. I believe the Lord has healed me. Because I can walk and I'm not stumbling his ankles. I feel completely refreshed and renewed. He woke up completely healed. Now watch. A couple days later, my father came to my house to visit us. And he was not using a cane or a walker. He was alive and energetic and continued to proclaim that God had healed him. A few days later, we had most of our family come down into town to stay with us. We had family members completely blown away, asking what we have to do to figure out what has really happened to him. What's going on? They were having a very hard time with this since the whole family had been planning his funeral. <laughs> My father went to the clinic in Cleveland, the University Hospital, to get a second opinion. The doctors did not understand what was going on. They'd have to do a series of tests to figure out what was going on. My father asked the doctor, can you please tell me if I have this brain disease? The doctor said... The only way we can tell is if we do a brain autopsy. That answer was good enough for us to know that Jesus healed my father. Watch this. And he used Todd White's obedience even though a girl made fun of his shoes. <laughs> I write to tell you that Jesus has now healed my father and his mind 100% and He's even renewing the gray hairs on his head. They're turning brown again. My father's not quitting work. He's signing contracts and closing deals. And he's a salesman that works for an energy company. Every deal he's running into, God's favor is on him. And he's signing every deal. The Lord provides not only for his health, but for him financially in years to come. We also believe that it's just the start of a segue of healing that God has for our entire family. He's obviously setting up something very big. He's allowing this reconciliation, restoration of relationships and forgiveness to overshadow the destruction of the enemy that he's tried to do in our whole family. There's a lot of people that have come to Christ and a lot of people that are being healed. My wife and I can't stop talking about this. They keep telling me to be quiet. But I tell people I'm not being quiet. This is my father. Jesus has healed my father. Since then, we've had many opportunities to pray for people and lay our hands on him and the Lord on them, and now the Lord is healing them. Watch this. Obviously, we all have this power in us because we have the same Holy Spirit that Jesus had when he was raised from the dead. And he said that we would do greater things.
So here's what I want you to do. I just want you to close your eyes. This is the most mixed up service ever. No, it's repentance and goodness. Goodness comes, the goodness of God produces repentance. It's amazing. And, and the power of God keeps you humble if you stay in right standing with God. It just does, because there's no way you can do that. I can't make someone's gray hairs turn brown. I can't make someone's disease to go away. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. It's about Christ in us, the hope of glory. But there is available an increase and an impartation for the reality of this same thing to be reproduced over and over and over and over and over and over again. So I'm just going to pray and I'm going to ask God, I just want you to lift, put your hands in front of you right now. Jesus. Can you do that lightly set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control? Because that's a really good song. Is that okay? Can you guys do that? Just real lightly. Father, I'm asking you right now. I'm asking you to touch people right now in the name of Jesus. The Holy Spirit, you right now would touch people. Come. Right now. God, I ask you to impart this right now in Jesus' name. More, Lord. Lord, I ask you right now. Come. Right now. Touch your people. Touch your people, God. In Jesus' name. Lord, I ask you to send a fire in people right now in Jesus' name. God, I ask you to start work from the head down right now. That your fingers would light up right now in the name of Jesus. That your head would light up in the name of Jesus. More, Lord. Holy Spirit, you're the baptizer. You're the one that fills us afresh. We ask you for more right now. More. Right now. Increase. More. Lord, I ask you to touch every hungry heart right now. All over the room. Impartation right now. Do it, God, right now. Come, Holy Spirit, touch your people. Right now. I'm asking God to touch you right where you're at. presence of God on your head and on your hands right now you can sense him wave your hands at me right now Holy Spirit I ask you for more right now more more God I ask you to touch people right now in the name of Jesus I ask you to brand people and mark people with your flame that they would be a conduit that they would be consciously aware of every person around them. Come. More, God, more. More, God, more. More. Touch, God, in Jesus' name. Baptize people in your presence. A deep awareness of your goodness. A deep awareness of your love. Jesus, thank you. Okay, now put your hand on somebody's shoulder right now beside you. Okay, you ready? Like, lots of people are going to be healed right now. 
And watch. And, and he's going to use you. And it's going to be amazing. Are you ready? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. This is really not complicated. We are the body of Christ. We are the hands and feet of God on this earth. Glory, be, glory being made manifest. Okay. So I want everybody to repeat after me. It's real simple. In the name of Jesus. Head be healed. If you have a deaf ear, put your hand up right now. Put your hand on your ear. If you have a deaf ear, put your hand on your ear. Okay. On the count of three, we're all going to say pop. And ears are going to open. It's going to be amazing. Because <laughs> he's really good. And it's part of your head. We just prayed for the head, okay? Okay. On the count of three, we're all going to say pop. On the count of three. And deaf ears will open now. One, two, three. Pop! If you just had an ear that opened, wave your hand right now. Come on. Come on. Ah, come on. So good. Come on. So good. Come on. Oh, it, oh, it's just amazing. Jesus, we thank you. Every problem in the neck and in the head, which includes the ears, eyes, mouth and throat, and everything in between, be healed right now. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus, for every shoulder being healed right now. If you have a problem with your shoulder, shoot it up. Bring it down and shoot it up. Bring it down and shoot it up. If it's gone, wave your hand. It's really not complicated. In the name of Jesus, heart. Lungs, kidneys, liver, all that other squishy stuff. Be healed right now in Jesus' name. Back, every disc, spinal cord, be healed in Jesus' name right now. Hips, be healed. Knees. Be healed. Ankles. Be healed. Fingers. Elbows. Head and shoulders, knees and toes. Every cell from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet. Be healed right now by the blood of Jesus. Now I need you to check your body all over top to bottom. Check whatever hurt you. Your hips, your knees, your back. Bend over. Check. Just check. Check anything and everything right now. I need you to check if that pain's still there because I guarantee you we see thousands healed in a moment. If what you were dealing with is gone, I need you to wave both hands over your head all over the room. One more time, put your hand on somebody. Are you ready? Every disease, every disease, in the name of Jesus, we command it to go right now in Jesus' name. Every sickness, every pain, in the name of Jesus, get out. All metal be removed in Jesus' name. Vision be restored in Jesus' name. Dreams be restored. Hope be restored in Jesus' name. Amen.
Come on, would you lift that up? I want more of you, Lord. Set a fire down in my soul. Take the take the control. Come on, you sing that. Jesus' name. Amen.